Obi Trice, real name, no gimmicks. <laughs> I don't know, it gets me every time. <laughs> it's an iconic opening to a song. Let's get it, let's get it. Obi Trice, real name, no gimmicks. The man that was an instrumental part of the Shady Records aftermath and G-Unit dynasty in the early 2000s. The Detroit rapper who seriously is named Obi Trice III. I know, it really does sound like some artsy rap name, but this Detroit rapper was an X Factor for Shady Records, dropping albums like Cheers and Second Rounds on Me, receiving platinum certifications, and being part of one of the most illustrious hip hop dynasties of all time. There is a chance you may be too young to remember, but Obi Trice was that dude in the early 2000s. However, Obi's popularity from the early 2000s to now has definitely subsided for a number of reasons. Some of them are pretty natural and common issues that rappers deal with in their careers, as well as unexpected tragedy. So what exactly happened to Obi Trice? From having thousands of fans knowing the lyrics to his songs before he even released an album, to playing a big part in the 50 Cent Ja Rule and Eminem and Benzino beefs, to suffering a gunshot wound to his head. Many fans who grew up on the slick rapping ability that Obi Trice provided us have been wondering what exactly happened to Obi and what is he up to now? Well, sit tight as we're going to break down the recent history of Obi Trice on this brand new episode of Where Are They Now? Coming from the same city as Eminem and much of his D12 crew, Obi Trice rose to prominence in the underground hip hop scene of Detroit, Michigan. If you're watching this video, then I assume that you've seen 8 Mile. Fun fact, Obi does make a cameo in the film. In the film 8 Mile, you remember the shelter, right? Where they would have all those rap battles? Well, this was based on a real place in Detroit called the Hip Hop Shop, where local MCs would come to perform and have rap battles. It's also where most of the D12 members met each other. I mean, you can go on YouTube and find countless videos of Eminem and Kniva and all these different D12 members battling each other. It's kind of a piece of history, you should check it out. The battles were hosted by the late D12 member Proof, who actually encouraged Obi to go by his birth name instead of the one that he was going by at the time, which was Obi-Wan. Obi-Wan, fake name, all gimmicks. I don't know, I'm, I'm just happy that he made that change. <laughs> After receiving a positive reception at the hip hop shop, Obi was encouraged to start taking rap a little bit more serious. This is when Obi, who was also good friends with another D12 member from Detroit, Bizarre, had introduced him to Eminem, who really took a liking to his music, and things seemed to take off from there. Obi signed the Shady Records in 2000. He would be featured in skits on the D12 group album, Devil's Night. He also delivered a verse on the track Drips for the Eminem show. Go ask your boy Michael McCrudden to recite that verse. He knows it heart by heart. As well as recording tracks for the 8 Mile soundtrack. Obi had been putting in work and it was time for the world to see what he was really capable of and boy did they find out when Obi dropped his debut album Cheers in September of 2003. So if he signed a contract with Shady Records, does that make it a shady deal? Cue the music. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I really cannot stress just how underrated of an album this is. I mean, it had production from Dr. Dre, Eminem, and Timbaland, with features from G-Unit, Busta Rhymes, and Nate Dogg. Like, come on, man. But maybe I do need to set the stage just a little bit so you understand the gravity of this project. Eminem and 50 Cent were probably the two most popular human beings on the face of the planet at the time. G-Unit was popping, D12 was multi-platinum, Dr. Dre was killing it, and they also happened to be in an all-out war with Ja Rule and Murder, Inc., but more specifically on Eminem's side, Benzino and The Source magazine. Now, there probably could be a whole separate video on this beef alone, but the reason the album Cheers played such a big role in it is because of tracks like Outro, We All Die One Day, and the classic diss track, Shit Hits The Fan, where we see Dr. Dre deliver probably the very best verse that he's ever had in his career, that's just my opinion. But these tracks were scathing at the time and absolutely still are if you listen back. But if you mix that in with the sheer level of dominance that Shady Aftermath and the G-Unit crew were exerting at the time, I mean, it really isn't a surprise when you consider what happened to Benzino and Ja Rule. Ja Rule completely fell off and never regained the same popularity. Like, I'm not even being mean here. The guy has never been the same. Where is Ja? Have me Ja Rule. And Benzino, oh Benzino. Well, he got fired from the source and the source eventually filed for bankruptcy. But yeah, people really don't consider how much Obi Trice's debut had a moment in hip hop history. And by the way, Benzino, I heard your daughter likes Toronto dudes. So tell her I say wagwan, shorty. <laughs> you stupid, are you dumb, huh? Y'all top love fam, you stupid. I'll host this whole video in his voice, dog. As the years went by, the shady aftermath, okay. <laughs> 
As the years went on, the dominance of Shady Aftermath started to dwindle. Eminem was on a hiatus and rumored to have retired. Dr. Dre was engulfed with the Detox album, which we never received. So it seemed like it was a perfect moment for Obi to ascend to a more prominent role in his label and in hip hop in general. He sought to do this with his follow-up to Cheers by dropping Second Rounds on Me in August of 2006. However, things were a little different leading up to this one. Although the album received critical praise, the album sold 74,000 copies in its first week, which honestly aren't bad numbers, especially for today's day and age, but in comparison to Cheers, which debuted by selling 226,000 on its first week, it was a massive drop off. Now, it really is easy to say that Obi fell off, but there are things that he was dealing with that you just gotta consider. On December 31st, 2005, Obi's car was shot at six times while traveling on the Lodge Expressway. One of the bullets hit Obi in the head and he went to the hospital to receive treatment. Doctors debated on removing the bullet or leaving it in, eventually opting not to remove it, meaning that Obi still has a bullet in his skull to this day. Now, I don't know about you guys, but after surviving a bullet to the head, I don't know, I'd absolutely be moving and thinking differently. It's a good thing that Obi Trice went to the doctor and not uh, Dr. Dre, <laughs> but uh... <laughs> Any, uh, anyone? Anyone? Uh. After recovering from the attack, tragedy would strike the Shady Records crew, the city of Detroit, and the hip hop community if we're being honest. D12's most beloved member, Proof, the same man who gave Obi his rap name, was tragically killed in a shooting at a Detroit nightclub after getting into a disagreement with another man at the club. Now, personally, I truly do think it's lost on a lot of fans just how important Proof was to rappers like Obi Trice and Eminem. He was a major part to the success of Shady Records and was truly looked at as a pillar in the hip hop community. So this truly rocked everyone when it happened, including Obi Trice, who made a speech at Proof's funeral. So after losing one of the most important people in your life and almost losing your own life in a shootout, this was a lot for Obi Trice to deal with. And in 2008, Obi officially departed from Shady Records due to not feeling like he was being properly promoted, despite many rumors circulating that at the time there was a follow between Obi, Eminem, and Dr. Dre when this just straight up wasn't the case. They still appeared on Obi's projects in the future even when he was officially off the label. Apparently it was more Jimmy Iovine, the head of Interscope Records, who was the real reason he left the label. When speaking about the relationship with Jimmy Iovine, he told Hot 97, I don't think Jimmy Iovine really cared for me. I was just me. Hey man, I hear you, Obi. Although Jimmy has given us great musical acts over the decades, I do kind of feel like Jimmy Iovine should be tried for his crimes against hip hop. Although, uh, sick headphones, fam, or whatever. Over the next decade, Obi Trice would go on to release a handful of mixtapes, projects like Bottoms Up and The Hangover, sticking with the drinking theme, and honestly, these were solid projects, but Obi never really got back to the popularity that he had during the prime Shady Records days. And as great of an artist Obi is, he is a human being and not absolved of making mistakes of his own. In 2019, TMZ reported that Obi had been arrested for shooting his girlfriend's son, where he apparently served 90 days in a Michigan jail for charges relating to the incident. There was also a show in Toronto where Obi went on what I can only describe as a DaBaby-esque rant about the LGBTQ community. So the state's trying to bully you into respecting this case. I don't f with the f yeah. I'm sorry to anybody that, that like to suck a man and like to suck men's I don't f with it. I can have a conversation with you, but I don't with what you do. Obi received backlash about the rant, and he publicly apologized, or kinda, I guess. Obi said, I understand the different perspectives and not wanting to be called any slurs, but I'm a hip hop artist and everything can't be taken so seriously. I didn't say anything to purposely offend anybody. I have no bias towards the community. See why I said that that apology was uh, kind of an apology. Yeah, not sure about that one. But while Obi may no longer be at the pinnacle of his career, he still serves his core fan base by dropping mixtapes and singles. His Spotify has a million monthly listeners. And if you haven't already been paying attention to this video now, then you understand the place that this man holds in hip hop history. Lyrical, lyrical, spiritual criminal. Individual, in your swimming pool. All right, slaughterhouse, <laughs> let's go. Ensembles, groups, bands, they're pretty commonplace in music. Maybe less common in the genre of hip hop, but that doesn't mean we haven't had some legendary and amazing rap groups over the years. One of the better ones of recent memory is the rap supergroup known as Slaughterhouse, comprised of its members Joe Budden, Royce the 5'9, Joel Ortiz, and Crooked Eye. The group was formed at the end of the 2000s when they signed to Shady Records and they gave us two mixtapes, an EP, and two albums. The group is unique for a number of reasons, one of them being that all four MCs were established rappers before forming this group. As you see, a lot of artists start off in a group and then typically break out into their own solo careers, see Beyonce and Justin Timberlake for reference. But this is hip hop, and there 
there's a lot of anticipation for Slaughterhouse's third studio album, Glass House, that never really materialized, and probably never will because, well, there's a lot of reasons. It also depends on who you ask, but the group did officially disband on April 26, 2018. So what exactly went wrong here? Some will just outright point the finger directly at Joe Budden, some say that it was Shady Records management, so why did we see a group of four world-class lyricists who are backed by one of the greatest and most successful artists of all time give us a limited amount of releases? If you want to find out, then stay tuned as we take a look at the recent history of Slaughterhouse on this brand new edition of Where Are They Now? So as I previously said, all these MCs had their own career before coming together at Slaughterhouse. New Jersey rapper Joe Budden, who at the time was mostly known for his mainstream hit record, Pump It Up, and the Mood Music mixtape series. Royce the 5'9", who is a rapper from Detroit and has an ongoing relationship with Eminem, appearing on his debut album, The Slim Shady LP, featured on tracks like Bad Meets Evil, as well as a handful of other collabs with Eminem. Joel Ortiz, who is from Brooklyn, also had a string of successful mixtapes and was signed to Dr. Dre's Aftermath Entertainment at one point. If there's anybody here who played the basketball game NBA Live 05, you know the one with Carmelo Anthony on the cover, I guarantee that you remember that Joel Ortiz song that used to play at the game's opening screen. And then there's Crooked Eye, who was also in close relation to the Aftermath camp during the early 2000s. Crook was signed to Death Row Records at one point. He was known for his slick wordplay and rhyming ability on tracks, as well as finding a very unique way to market himself and release music, such as the Hip Hop Weekly series. Crook would drop a freestyle once a week over a popular instrumental, and he was actually one of the first people to really do this and put out a track once a week. Now you see a lot of people's marketing campaign revolves around things like that. Now, none of these guys were exactly a pop culture mega superstar, but they had each earned their stripes and had their own respective careers. However, the one one thing that these four seem to have the most in common was one thing, bars. If there's anything that you can always count on and expect out of these four rappers that make up Slaughterhouse, it is elite, top of the line bars, lyrics, wordplay, all that good stuff. Joe, Royce, Crook, and Joel are some of the best lyrical rappers of all time. So if that's your favorite type of rap, you know, lyrical bar heavy tracks, then the idea of these four starting a group is like a match made in heaven. It almost doesn't sound fair, like Golden State Warriors levels of an overpowered team, like, come on now. The way the group was actually formed was on a track for Joe Budden's Halfway House album, which just so happened to feature Royce to 5'9", Joel Ortiz, and Crooked Eye, and the song was called Slaughterhouse. Based off how good the song ended up being and the reception the MCs got from the track, they decided to form a supergroup together, and the name obviously coming from the first track they recorded. On August 11, 2009, they released their debut self-titled album with no major label attached to it and sold 18,000 copies. This led to speculation on whether or not the group would be signing with Shady Records, and through multiple interviews and online posts, the members of the group expressed that their previous label, E1, was blocking the deal which made it difficult, but eventually Slaughterhouse did sign the Shady Records, and this was confirmed on January 12, 2011. Slaughterhouse posed alongside Eminem and Yellow Wolf for a cover in Double XL magazine, proclaiming a new era of Shady Records. We also covered Yellow Wolf in a Where Are They Now video, so you can check that out here. The same year that this new era of Shady Records are were being ushered in, they really made their mark with this iconic cipher from the BET Hip Hop Awards, which is easily one of the best and most consistent ciphers that you'll ever see. After a number of singles and a promotional mixtape titled On The House, Slaughterhouse released their second studio album, but their first one was Shady Records titled Welcome To Our House on August 28, 2012. The project sold 52,000 units the first week and just under 150,000 units that entire year. Considering this to be a big commercial failure, there was a lot of speculation as to why Slaughterhouse was not more successful. Many point out that Welcome to Our House does have a more commercial feel with multiple songs appealing to a mainstream sound, perhaps in hopes of breaking through to receiving consistent radio play, however this didn't really translate. Many also placed the blame on Eminem because he did have a big influence on the album with choosing the singles. He took the reception from Welcome to Our House pretty hard, so he decided to distance himself creatively from the group in hopes of not further hindering their sound. Now at this point, tensions were rising between the camp and Shady Records, although most of this was attributed to Joe Budden, who apparently felt like he was entitled to more money once they started working on their third album, Glass House. Eminem claims Joe was misinformed and there was not any extra money that he was entitled to simply because the album sold poorly and didn't even generate enough money to begin with. This caused Joe to seriously distance himself from releasing music with the group. Joe, when speaking, this was Joe's official or unofficial departure from Slaughterhouse, as Joe kinda had his own thriving career going on at this point, with the success of his podcast, Love and Hip Hop, and other ventures like Everyday Struggle. I mean, it really could just be a video by itself looking at the life and career Joe went on to lead as a podcaster and cultural commentator 
in the world of hip hop. And I mean, it really is no secret. It's a common notion for Joe Budden that once he's involved with or creates something that is great and everybody enjoys, like let's say his music, Slaughterhouse, Everyday Struggle, or his podcast from the Spotify deal to Rory and Maul leaving, there's just this habit that Joe has from walking away from something once he feels he's entitled to more. Joe looks at this more as knowing your worth, while some fans say Joe is simply a chronic self-sabotager. I personally think there's a lot of merit and truth to both of these narratives. Joe's straight up a polarizing guy, what else can you say? Joe Budden and M reached the height of their issues when M released his album Revival, which received mixed and negative reviews. However, Joe did not hold back providing scathing commentary about the album on more than one of his platforms before it even came out. I mean, nobody really had anything nice to say about this Revival album. This is what led to M releasing Kamikaze not too long after, and on this album, he takes clear shots at Joe when he raps. Somebody tell Budden before I snap he better fasten it or have his body bag get zipped. The closest thing he's had to hits is smacking obviously in reference to Joe's domestic abuse allegations. Now, once Joe heard this, he spent about 90 minutes of his next podcast episode breaking down the problems between him and Eminem, and he also claimed to be a better rapper than M for the past 10 years. Many of the group's members have spoken out about Joe and M's differences, saying that Joe was wrong to have gone off on Revival so harshly, especially given the fact that when he did, he was still signed to Shady Records, most notably Crooked Eye. When Joe did his Revival criticism, I knew something that the public didn't know. I I knew that there was something there that Joe had an issue with the label and M already. So when I heard the criticism, I knew Joe kind of crossed the line. I mean, to this point, that kind of makes sense. It's like if I made a diss track about Michael McCrudden and dropped it at the end of this video. You can't exactly do that. But then again, it's very easy to listen to the erratic rants of Joe Budden and easily pinpoint him as the person to blame for things falling apart. But then other members of the group kind of share a similar sentiment as Joe as to why things didn't work out, placing most of the blame on Shady's management and handling of Slaughterhouse. Right, the music yeah, was good, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. We rap well? Yeah, yeah. You're best in the game. Okay, so if it has nothing to do with music, Music, then it has to do with business. And you know, despite the wild fluctuating emotions and actions of Joe Budden, the group was making good music. Every MC was absolutely on their A game when it came time to step in the booth. So was it really Joe wanting more money that was able to ruin the potential of what these four very talented men could accomplish? Would they have flourished to greater heights without the mishandling of Shady Records management team? Honestly, it's something we probably will never have a clear answer to as the group officially announced they are no longer on April 26, 2018. Each member has found different endeavors, Joe and Crook becoming successful podcasters, Roy's continuing to hone his craft and release dope projects, same with Joel who does have a new song that was featured on the latest NBA 2K game. The closest we ever got to a reunion was the track on Eminem's latest album, Music To Be Murdered By, that saw all the members unite and spit a verse that is everybody except Joe Budden, of course, who has retired from making any rap music at all. Will we ever get to hear Glasshouse, or will we ever see Joe Budden and Eminem reunite? Maybe on an epic Joe Budden podcast episode? I don't know, I think I'm reaching here, but a hip hop fan can dream, can he? Yeehaw! Oh, we doing Yellow Wolf. Shout out Alabama. I'm not gonna do any Alabama impressions. I can't, I can't. All right, let's go. Yellow Wolf is a man who got his start as an underground rapper from a small town in the Southern United States and eventually found major label success after signing to Eminem Shady Records and dropping his 2011 banger of an album, Radioactive. Back then, Yellow Wolf would draw an inspiration from his humble rural beginnings to explore the new possibilities of a hip hop sound fused with a little good old fashioned Southern charm. But after a career that has spanned nearly two decades, Yellow Wolf is ready to say goodbye to hip hop and hello to a new phase of his career. Yellow Wolf was born Michael Wayne Atha on December 30th, 1979 in Gadsden, Alabama, and his mother Sheila named him after the legendary actors Michael Landon and John Wayne. Legendary company right there. His father was a full-blood Cherokee and that First Nation heritage is what eventually led to Michael embracing the name Yellow Wolf. But we'll get to that in a moment or two. When Michael was still a child, his mom split from his father and began dating a sound engineer. This would help Michael organically develop a love for music because he got to experience things few others in his age group did. Like being on stage next to Dwight Yoakam at only six years old, or seeing Run DMC stop by his house to party with his folks. I don't know, if you're hanging out with Run DMC in your childhood, you're kind of destined to be a musician. By the time that he was a young adult, this gave Michael all the encouragement he needed to set out and conquer the music industry. In honor of his Cherokee heritage, he dubbed himself Yellow Wolf and kicked off his artistic career by painting murals around his hometown of Gadsden. 
He would work as a street artist by day, and then at night, perfect his music skills. One of Wolf's earliest attempts at breaking into the industry took place in 2005, when he appeared as a contestant on the UPN reality series, The Road to Stardom with Missy Elliott. Yellow Wolf. Welcome to my land, my home, Bama. These 13 have beaten thousands for a seat on Missy's tour bus. Man, imagine a Missy Elliott and Yellow Wolf collab. I don't know. I don't know if the world needs it, but it would be it would be interesting to say the least. Wolf did his best to win the grand prize of $100,000 and a record deal by being the last man out of 13 performers, but he was ultimately eliminated. Rather than hang his head in defeat, Yellow Wolf hit the studio to release his independent album, Creekwater, which dropped in 2005. Two years later, Yellow Wolf had earned himself a contract with Columbia Records and dropped a new single, Kickin'. That track was supposed to act as a precursor to his first studio album, Fearin' and Loathin' in Small Town, USA, but the project would never materialize and Yellow Wolf was dropped from Columbia later that year. At this point, Yellow Wolf was desperate. More than that, he was homeless. Living for a time in the city of Berkeley, he picked up a gig working on the ship off the coast of Washington State. Then showcasing his resiliency yet again, Yellow Wolf would bounce back with a series of mixtapes. By reinventing himself by dressing head to toe in deer hunting camo and flashing gold cap teeth, in 2009, Yellow Wolf traveled to Atlanta, signed with Ghetto Vision Entertainment, and formed a country hip hop rock band that included both a DJ and a fiddle player. I mean, talk about diversity. At the time, he described this new sound as arena rap, and this experimental sound began to pull huge crowds in Atlanta. Despite the novelty and innovation of what he was doing, Yellow Wolf was still poor. Running out of chances, he moved back to Alabama, where he began to work with producer Will Power on the album that would become his breakthrough success, Trunk Music. Once this mixtape dropped in November of 2010, there was really no looking back for Yellow Wolf. He earned himself a major deal with Interscope Records, and the following year, he became of Shady Records' imprint, finally dropping his debut studio album, Radioactive, just before 2011 turned into 2012. I think the best advice I got from that, my time at Shady, was uh, to Trust myself to walk away if I need to, to take time and to figure things out. Throughout the next few years, Yellow Wolf would team up with Travis Barker of Blink-182 to drop a rap rock EP titled Psycho White. And he'd also release his second studio album, Love Story, in 2015. Prior to his third album's release, Trial by Fire, Yellow Wolf kicked off a tour to hype up the album, which would come to a turning point in his career, especially after it came to an unceremonious end with Yellow Wolf having something of a freak out on stage. During this time in his life, Yellow Wolf was dealing with a heck of a lot. He not only lost a very close personal friend in Shoddy Fat, but he was also struggling with alcoholism and he had temporarily broken up with his girlfriend, Canadian pop singer Fifi Dobson. To top it all off, he was having psychosemantic reactions to his new favorite pastime, smoking as much weed as possible. Following these frightening developments, Yellow Wolf would announce that he was changing his moniker to MWA, an acronym for his given name. He'd then proceed to disappear completely from the music scene for a period of months, conceivably to work out his issues, including reuniting with his girlfriend Fifi. Ah, you love a happy ending to a love story. When he popped back up in June 2017, he had gone back to calling himself Yellow Wolf and promised to drop Trial by Fire by the end of the year, and a promise he delivered on. His next project, Trunk Music 3, would come to be his last on Shady Records, seeing a release in the early stages of 2019, then marrying Fifi in September of 2019. Wolf would drop his album Ghetto Cowboy the following month and release it under his independent label, Slumerican. Cool play on words there. Considering how he started off by independently releasing Creekwater, it seems like with Ghetto Cowboy, Wolf's career has come full circle. Perhaps in recognition of this development, Wolf has decided to more or less close the book on his hip hop chapter. In April of 2021, he released four different projects, all of them collaborative albums with some big names in hip hop like Riff Raff, DJ Paul, DJ Muggs, and Kayski. He then dropped his latest studio album, Mudmouth, as a way to say goodbye to his former style of music, perhaps forever. When speaking with Hot New Hip Hop about this decision, he told them, Mudmouth is it for a long time. I don't know when the next time I'm going to return to make another hip hop record. So I just want to give as much as I could before the next phase of my career starts. As for what the T's next phase of his career holds, well, that's still something of a question mark, but it definitely seems like Wolf will be exploring more rock heavy sound. What we do know is that outside of music, Wolf has also created his very own hundred proof whiskey, named after his first album, Creekwater. Similar to Canadian and Irish whiskey, Creekwater is crafted in Durham, North Carolina by using a bourbon mash of 21% rye, 4% malt, and 75% corn, then infusing it with the aromas of tobacco and maple syrup. This business venture to open up a whole new world of income for him. Hell, if the product is half as good as it sounds, I think he may have a winner on his hands. Before D12 would become one of the most popular hip hop groups of the late 90s and early 2000, thanks in large part to the membership of Slim Shady, AKA Eminem. 
before D12 would lose both bugs and proof to gun violence throughout the course of their career. Before D12 would be declared over and finished by none other than Eminem himself on his 2018 song Stepping Stone. Many eclectic, eccentric, and talented artists, especially when it pertains to hip hop. Few of these individuals have been more famous though than Eminem. But in 1996, five other Detroit based rappers, Proof, Bazaar, Mr. Porter, Caniva, and Bugs got together to form a hip hop supergroup. Their own rise to success would be intertwined with Detroit's most famous son, Eminem, after he officially joined their group in 1999 following the death of their member, Bugs, and D12, otherwise known as the Dirty Dozen, was officially born. With Emma aboard, their debut album, Devil's Night, would become a nationwide billboard topper and slingshot them to superstardom. But just as Eminem's own demons would catch up with him in the mid 2000s, so would D12's, and the group would slowly break apart over a number of years. It was popping, guys, as your boy Marlon Palmer. Recent drops in this series have included looks at the cast of Everybody Loves Chris and Beetlejuice from The Howard Stern Show. Crazy, crazy stories. Please check those out. Since the show works off request, don't forget to leave us some ideas with who you want to see next, and I'll catch you guys after the intro. The group known as D12 originally began back in the late 90s and featured a large crew of members and affiliates, but the core six consisted of Proof, Bizarre, Caniva, Mr. Porter, Bugs, and eventually Eminem. Now you're probably saying to yourself, that's cool, but that's only six people, not a dozen. So what's up with that? Well, the other six members are each rapper's alter ego. Proof was also known as Dirty Harry, Bizarre as Peter S. Bizarre, Caniva as Rondell Bean, Mr. Porter as Con Artist, Bugs as Robert Beck, and Eminem as Slim Shady, the real Slim Shady. All you other Slim Shadies are just, I'll stop, I'm sorry. When this group banded together, they dropped their first project, the Underground EP in 1997. And while it was ultimately far different than the sound they would eventually settle on, it still featured solid performances and some super raw M verses. But before the group could go further and discover who they were as a collective, they faced their first brush with death. On May 21st, 1999, Bugs was murdered in a drive-by shooting after a friend's cousin was sprayed with a water gun that ultimately escalated to a tragic conclusion in which Bugs was shot and then and ran over by a vehicle, ending this talented young man's life before it was time was due. Upon hearing about what happened, D12 was understandably devastated, but this tragedy ultimately brought them closer than ever to create a truly legendary hip hop collective in honor of their fallen friend. Before he had passed on, Bugs had spoken highly of the rapper known as Swift McVay, which became the co-sign that would turn Swift into D12's newest sixth member. Then Eminem, who to this point had not officially declared himself a member of the group, signed on to become their de facto figurehead, and honestly, it couldn't have come at a better time. That's because M's own career at this point was blowing up and his connection with the legendary Dr. Dre would prove to be beneficial for everyone. While D12 wouldn't appear in M's initial The Slim Shady LP, they would become an integral presence to his next album, The Marshall Mathers LP. A classic, absolute classic. Much like with Eminem at this stage in his career, shock lyricism would become a staple of the D12 brand as they embraced becoming the super villains of the rap world alongside Slim Shady. From there, they parlayed this exposure into their debut studio album, Devil's Night, a reference to the tradition in and around Detroit of setting unoccupied buildings on fire the night before Halloween. You know, the usual stuff. The album would go multi-platinum, and although their childish antics and ultra-violent lyrics ensured that they'd never quite received their due praise from critics, the group still became a runaway success commercially with hit singles like Fight Music and Purple Pills. Of course, over on TV and the radio, most of us knew Purple Pills by its censored name of Purple Hills. D12 had to edit the single in order for MTV to agree to air it, and while this was something Eminem rarely ever agreed to do for his solo work, he decided to acquiesce to this request, telling XXL Magazine at the time, I mean, we could stick to our guns and say, look, we're making it purple pills. And then guess what? No radio play, no record sales. If you wanna eat, this is what you gotta do. You gotta change pills to hills. Even though their material was dealing with censorship issues, D12 continued to thrive. They'd go on to appear in Eminem's further releases like The Eminem Show, as well as the Eight Mile soundtrack. They'd also appeared alongside their friend Obi Trice on his project Cheers. But you know how it goes with success. You'll find yourself surrounded on all sides by both friends and enemies. And D12 definitely had their fair share of the latter one of whom for a time was the Detroit rapper Royce the 5'9". Back in these early days, Royce had beef with D12 after a misunderstanding led to bad blood. It all started when Royce said in a freestyle, anger management. I need to hire somebody to manage my anger. At the time, D12 was on a tour that just so happened to be called anger management, and they took this as a personal slight. 
This feud began to heat up when Royce released diss tracks like Shit On You and Malcolm X, and D12 responded in kind with the song Back Down. Eventually the beef would be squashed, but not before Royce and Proof both pulled guns on one another, got arrested, and then settled their differences from adjoining jail cells. Which honestly might be the most Detroit thing I've ever heard. An album D12 world, but to a lot of fans, something sounded off especially when it pertained to M's parts. While the single My Band proved to be extremely popular, something had changed and these days the album is largely forgotten by most hip hop historians. These chicks don't even know the name of my band. That was, that was crack. As it turns out, Eminem was quietly beginning to battle his many, many demons, including addiction and depression, and he took a step back from the band after the release of their sophomore effort. After this, the other members of D12 pondered what to do next, but then tragedy would strike yet again. This time, it was Proof who would find himself a murder victim at a Detroit nightclub after an altercation turned violent in April 2006. Following four years of inactivity, they released a mixtape titled Return of the Dozen Volume 1 as a way to get back on their feet, but because the project lacked Eminem, who was working on his own solo album, Relapse, it never quite found its audience. The same can be said for Return of the Dozen Volume 2, which dropped three years later in April of 2011. But then, only a few months later, Eminem posted a video to YouTube that showed back in the studio with not only D12, but Royce as well, stating that a new album would be on its way soon, with everyone reunited. But the rumored project has never seen the light of day. Instead, most members of D12 have gone their own way. First, Mr. Porter took up the role as Eminem's hype man after the passing of Proof, and these two broke off from the rest of the pack. Then in 2012, Bizarre left the group as well, citing creative differences. And while many of the members have occasionally reconvened for efforts like Bane off of Eminem's 15 compilation, Slim Shady himself finally put all speculation to rest when on his song Stepping Stone from Kamikaze he rapped, the less is left for closure, so let's let this go. It's not goodbye to our friendship, but D12 is over. After that nail in the coffin, the other members of D12 have all focused on their solo careers. In 2019, Swift, Caniva, and Bizarre teamed up under the D12 banner for a rare tour of Europe alongside Snoop Dogg. But after the worldwide lockdowns that set in soon after, that's put any other touring plans on hold for the time being. As for the rest of the D12 story, well, that's a video for another time and place. After all, this is Where Are They Now? I can't see my legs! After 50 Cent exploded on the scene with Get Richard Die Trying, selling over 9 million copies and becoming one of the top rappers of this generation with a Grammy and 82 other wins. Everybody who supported me too, everybody who went out and bought the record, thank you. After 50 had a kid with baby mama Shanika Tompkins and another with model Daphne Joy, while dating the likes of Vivica A. Fox, Ciara, and Chelsea Handler. After 50's G Unit Empire would include his own record label, books, sneakers, headphones, a video game, and a biographical film, laying the groundwork for a monthly income of over $180,000. Give me a piece of this cheese. After 50 Cent went on to become a boxing promoter and get involved in other sports. And his first pitch was not great. Just a bit outside. 50 Cent was one of the biggest hip hop stars to come out of the millennium and he was smart enough to expand his business before his album started to flop. But dealing with baby mama drama and rap beefs while you have millions riding on different projects isn't easy. And soon the rap star would be spending more time inside of courtrooms than recording booths. I was just listening to Get Richard Die Trying the other day and 50's rise onto the scene was absolutely epic. So let's take a look at what's been going on as of recent. And I know, I know, he's still famous. I know. What's going on guys? My name is Michael McCredden, documenting the life and career of 50 Cent after his initial rise to fame, here for you on After They're Famous. Now we've done a bunch of other after videos on rap stars like Nelly and Lauren Hill. Nelly didn't like it. He unfollowed me on Instagram or blocked me. Anyway, be sure to browse around and let us know in the comments down below who's next. I feel like 50's gonna wish death upon me after this video. James Jackson III was born on July 6, 1975 in Queens, New York City. He was raised by a single mother, a lesbian crack dealer who was murdered when he was just 8. He started dealing in his teens, then picked up rapping and started gaining a buzz in New York. But it wasn't until 50 survived getting shot at 9 times that things really started to pick up. If you want to know more about his come up story, we have done it before their famous video on 50 and it's still really good. Curtis Jackson had taken to selling drugs on the street as young as 12 years old. People knew him as Boo Boo. He started G Unit and it turns out a few bullets to the jaw helped make his sound one of a kind. He was signed by Eminem and Dr. Dre and shot to stardom with the release of his first solo album, Get Rich or Die Trying, in 2003. The Massacre was another smash hit, but after 2006, the superstar sales started to dip. But 
M50 is a man of diversification and had new projects lined up, including a guest appearance on The Simpsons. Jeepers, it's 50 Cent! Yo, V, I heard you throw down on stage. Wanna join my world talk? Sorry, Fiddy, I have school tomorrow. By the mid-2000s, 50 had already expanded his brand to include his own music label, film company, books, sneakers, vodka, he even had his own video game. Of course, there was his semi-autobiographical film, Get Rich or Die Trying. Gun selling, crack dealing, gangster would be into. But he really was. Formula 50, later renamed Vitamin Water, caught 50's attention after he drank a bottle of it at the gym. He invested in the young company and even worked out a new flavor for them, grape. I want that purple stuff. When Coca-Cola bought the company in 2007 for over $4 billion, 50 Cent watched his bank account go up by a cool $100 million. But as the tried and true saying goes, the more money you make, the more problems you get. First there was Taco Bell who used his name to promote cheap menu items, an ad agency that used his image, and someone sampling PIMP without his permission. The G-Unit mogul took each and every one down in court. He even sued his own legal team when they messed up a case about his headphone company and won. Yeah, that's right. Law school ain't got nothing on the school of hard knocks. It wasn't all bad news though. The mayor of Bridgeport, Connecticut gave 50 Cent a key to the city and declared October 12th as 50 Cent Curtis Jackson Day. In 2005, GQ magazine named 50 one of its men of the year and in his interview he called the then president George W. Bush both incredible and a gangster. Let's get back to the legal stuff. Those settlements, 50 and 1, well they were about to come in handy because he took a bit of a hit when the recession came in 2008. He was forced to sell some of his investments like Diamond Mines and the mansion he had just bought off Mike Tyson. Tyson. Just as this happened, his home in New York shared with baby mama Shanika Tompkins. Well, that went up in flames while he was away filming. After that, she sued him for 50 million in child support. Then baby mama too took him to court for domestic violence and vandalism charges. And finally, the cherry on top, the epic beef between him and Rick Ross. What started as a misunderstanding at an award show quickly blossomed into some diss tracks, threats, and 50 revealing to the world that Rose used to be a correctional officer. Even the game who was on Rick Ross's side agreed that 50 had won the battle. But then 50 released a sex tape of Ross's ex without her permission, and he'd gone too far. And he found himself in court again in July of 2015. During the trial, Curtis revealed he was over 30 million in debt and his bank account was down to 4.4 million. When the jury ordered him to pay 7 million in damages, he filed for personal bankruptcy protection days later. While all this was going on, the public seemed a whole lot more interested in the bankruptcy headlines than his brand new album, Animal Ambition. Yeah, no one cared. The rap titan, did he really go from 155 million to broke? No one could believe it. Well, his Instagram account, it would suggest that he had not. In the past, he's posted images like this, and this, and this. He went from get rich or die trying to stay rich and try lie. Sorry, that's that's not the greatest, but he's the rapper, not me. <clears throat> At the time of this recording, 50 has already paid off his bankruptcy plan. He used the law to his favor, suing the legal team who lost him a court battle against Sleek Audio Headphone Company, claiming they mismanaged his case and he got them to pay off Sleek Audio. Now with money in the bank, 50 is set to go back on tour with good old Chris Brown. Good on him. As for the rest of the story, well, we'll have to wait and see because this is after their famous. Eminem released the Slim Shady LP in 1999 and the album went multi-platinum, earning for Marshall Mathers two Grammy Awards and four MTV Video Music Awards. After Eminem climbed to the top of the Billboard charts with his tracks The Way I Am, Without Me, Stan, Not Afraid, Cleaning Out My Closet and everybody's least favorite track, Ass Like That, Marshall Mathers would welcome his daughter Haley Jade Scott with girlfriend Kim Ann Scott. After Eminem worked his way through the Detroit underground rap scene, blowing away many a spectator for him being white. There was the lawsuit with his mother, there was the lawsuit where he attacked a man who was kissing his ex-wife, he also held hands with Elton John. Then there was D12, there was 8 Mile, he also discovered 50 Cent and promoted him heavily. And then for himself, well he kind of fell off the wagon. He became addicted to prescription drugs and it nearly cost him his life. But then we got the albums Relapse and Recovery, and he took the world by storm again as a rap god. What's going on guys, my name is Michael McCrenda and welcome to After They're Famous, documenting the life and career of celebrities after their initial launch to fame, here for you on After They're Famous. Now we already did a Before They're Famous on Eminem, but I realized there was so much more to tell. So that's why we're doing a follow up here on After They're Famous, much like we did with Dr. Dre. Typically on this series, I do people whose careers kind of fizzled out, or they went cray cray, Eminem, he is a god. And uh, that's why we gotta keep telling this story. As always, be sure to let me know in the comments down below who you want me to talk about next.
Wow, that was all done in one take. After two years of working with Dre, Eminem released the Slim Shady LP, which became an instant success and went on to sell over 3 million copies. Now, I, in fact, was one of those white suburban kids who got his hands on this album, and then when I broke it, I went and bought it again. And then when it came out on iTunes, I bought it again. Cause you just can't get enough. It was really good. It still is. In the time from when Marshall Mathers first met with Dr. Dre, he went from being an unemployed minimum wage cook to being a global sensation. Then all of a sudden, well, he decided to marry his high school sweetheart, Kim, and the two, well, they had a little daughter to take care of. And now they had the money to do so properly. Following the success of the Slim Shady LP, Eminem got to work on the Marshall Mathers LP. And when this dropped in the summer of 2001, well, Eminem had unintentionally made rap mainstream. His lyrics were boycotted by religious groups, suburban parents, the LGBT community, and he picked on practically everyone in pop culture. It seemed to be a situation where it was him versus the world with the exception of Marilyn Manson. He seemed to really like that dude. Joe Mathers LP sold over 19 million copies worldwide and it won a Grammy for Best Rap Album. Now with mainstream media not understanding that Eminem or Slim Shady were creations of Marshall Mathers' lyrical genius, he decided he would do something a little different. And that's when he performed at the 2001 Grammys with no other than Elton John. Marshall's career, it was red hot, but his personal relationships, they were falling apart. He had called it quits to his marriage to Kim and she had attempted suicide, but later came up with a much better idea which was to sue Eminem for his track Kim. And if you listen to that thing, well, she had a strong argument. Also, Marshall's mother, she was looking for some money for his track Cleaning Out My Closet and she sued him for $10 million. Now she was only awarded 25,000 bucks and then after lawyer fees, well, she only walked away with $1,600. <sighs> yeah. Following this, there was 8 Mile, which was loosely based on Eminem's story growing up. And since I've done his Before They Are Famous, I can tell you there are a lot of parallels. Now, while filming this, he was operating sober, something he hadn't done in recent years. The lengthy shooting schedule had him on set 16 hours a day. Between takes, he would write tracks, including Lose Yourself, but he wasn't always that productive. He was battling insomnia. He was given his first taste of prescription medication, popping back Ambien, which allowed him to finally get some sleep. The Eminem show was released in May 2002. It was another success, reaching number one on the charts and selling over 1.3 million copies during its first full week. Throughout this catalog, now Eminem, he has picked a feud with many a celebrity, but it was his track, Just Lose It, that had a few Hollywood insiders saying, uh, Eminem, you've gone too far. In the song, Eminem raps about Michael Jackson and even dresses up as him in the video. Now Stevie Wonder, of all people, he described it as Eminem kicking a man while he's down and uh, he called the whole thing bullshit. But how did Stevie Wonder even know, really? By the way, Eminem wrote the hook for that song in a total of 30 seconds. This time, Eminem caught wind of another rapper who had recently been shot, including taking a bullet to the face. He was pushing mixtapes and putting successful rappers on blast, which caught M's attention. Let's take a look at a clip from 50 Cent's Before They're Famous. Eminem then flew 50 Cent to Los Angeles to meet with him and Dr. Dre and they signed him for a $1 million deal. Then 50 Cent dropped No Mercy, No Fear and finally Get Rich or Die Trying. Now with Eminem experiencing more success than he could ever imagine, well he decided to give back to his boys that he came up with, the fellas in D12. They got together to pump out some new material. In that group you've got his longtime BBF proof, there's Caniva, Swifty McVeigh and of course everyone's favorite, Bizarre. He continued to make headlines with stories of the the Secret Service launching an investigation after his lyrics were interpreted as death threats against the then President George W. Bush. Eminem put out a greatest hits with Curtain Call and announced that he was going to take some time off from his rap career. Unknown to most, it was his drug addiction that had him a little lost, or very lost, and during his hiatus from music, there were few spottings of Eminem outside of his Detroit mansion. When people did see him, well, he was unrecognizable. Due to a massive weight gain, eventually his dependence and overindulgence in Vicodin, Xanax, and Valium, well, it led to his hospitalization. In December of 2007, he overdosed and collapsed in the bathroom of his home, which is probably not the way he would ever have wanted to go. Sounds a whole lot to me like Elvis. He reached out to an old friend, Elton John, who mentored him for 18 months while he kicked his addiction. He focused on running to get himself back in shape, stating that it's never cool to be out of breath, especially for that of a rapper. <clears throat> I'm surprised I can do these videos. Sometimes it's a little much. 
He released his first album of new music in five years, Relapse, back in 2009, featuring the singles Crack a Bottle and Beautiful. The next year, he released Recovery with the singles Not Afraid, Love the Way You Lie, and Spacebound, which starred Sasha Gray in the video. Also done it before they were famous on Sasha Gray. Yeah, I do a lot of these videos. For Eminem's hard work, he picked up a Grammy Award for Best Rap Album and followed this up with the Marshall Mathers LP2 in 2013. And the rest of the story, well, you know the story because this is After They Are Famous. My name is Mike McCredden. Thanks for checking out my personal channel. I do all sorts of celebrity bios on here. Be sure to let me know in the comments down below who you want to hear about next. I got a feeling someone's going to suggest Elvis. So, yeah, I'm going to film that later today. I'll see you guys in another video.